on World News Tonight. No survivors. The search continues as deadly Yeti airplane crashes highlights dangers of flying in Nepal. Finally revealed. China releases official data on COVID-19 related deaths for the first time since lifting restrictions last month. Playing with fire. The West is supplying Ukraine with war tanks for the first time. In doing so, are they poking the sleeping dragon? And festive spirit. The Chinese gear up for the spring festival as it lingers near. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News this Monday night. Now we are starting off with the terrifying final moments of the plane crash in Nepal as dozens of families are mourning for their loved ones. At least 68 people died when a flight from Kathmandu to the tourist town of Pokhara crashed and caught fire. While rescue efforts are underway, Kathmandu police say that hopes of finding any survivors from Nepal's worst air disaster in decades are fading. Scores of people were killed on Sunday when a plane crashed in Nepal. The Yeti Airlines domestic flight was carrying 72 people from the capital Kathmandu when it went down in Pakara in clear weather, according to officials from Nepal's Civil Aviation Authority. Footage shows rescuers scouring the wreckage and scorched earth around the site. <laughs> Nepal's Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal at Kathmandu's Tribhavan International Airport said it was a tragic incident and that he'd be calling an emergency cabinet meeting with an ongoing investigation into the cause. A Yeti Airlines spokesman confirmed those aboard the twin-engine ATR-72 aircraft included two infants and four crew members. It was also carrying international passengers, including five Indians, four Russians, one Irish, two South Koreans, one Australian, one French, and one Argentine national. Deadly air incidents are common in Nepal, which has small airports in mountainous terrain, where weather conditions can change quickly. And the European Union has banned Nepali airlines from its airspace since 2013, citing safety concerns. The Sunday crash is Nepal's worst since 1992, the Aviation Safety Network database showed, when a Pakistan International Airlines Airbus A300 crashed into a hillside upon approach to Kathmandu, killing all 167 people on board. Now on to China's first release of official data on COVID-19 related deaths since the lifting of restrictions last month. China said that it had recorded nearly 60,000 fatalities linked to the coronavirus in the month since the country lifted its strict zero COVID policy, accelerating an outbreak that is believed to have infected millions of people. The disclosure was the first time China has provided an official measure of the COVID wave now sweeping the country and represents a huge spike in the official death toll. After almost three years of closure due to COVID-19 restrictions, Hong Kong's high-speed railway line to mainland China has finally reopened. The move is part of China's dismantling of its zero-COVID policy. Trains don't yet run all the way to Beijing, but for many passengers, it's nonetheless a welcome step. A large exit wave sparked by the dumping of many restrictions seems to be weakening, with infection numbers falling, according to a health commission official. China has reported nearly 60,000 deaths in people who had COVID-19 since early December. But these numbers are considered an underestimate by many due to restrictive case definition criteria compared with other countries. So far, surges have mainly been in the big cities of China. But as the country gears up for its New Year celebrations, there are fears that holidaymakers could spread the virus into more rural areas. U.S. President Joe Biden has declared a major disaster in the state of California as the latest in the succession of storm systems brought heavy flooding to already waterlogged regions and threatened snowfalls of up to two meters. It seems like a never-ending deluge. Violent storms are pounding California since it was caught in the throes of atmospheric rivers, rarely seen in such frequent succession since December 26th. These rivers occur in the sky in long, narrow corridors and are storms that unleash massive amounts of rain. So far, this natural phenomenon has killed dozens and left over 68,000 households without electricity, 
while bringing floods, power outages, mudslides, evacuations and road closures. The waterlogged state is not done yet as the California Department of Water Resources announced that seven waterways were officially flooded. Meanwhile, the UC Berkeley Central Sierra Snow Lab tweeted Saturday morning that it received 54 centimeters of snow in 24 hours and that its snowpack of about three meters was expected to grow by Monday. While the ninth and final atmospheric river is due to hit the soaked state on Monday, the weather forecast predicts the beginning of dry days on Tuesday. Tens of thousands of Israelis have rallied in three cities to protest plans by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to implement changes to the country's legal system and weaken the Supreme Court. Benjamin Netanyahu's new hard-right government has been in office for just over two weeks and is already being challenged by 80,000 protesters in central Tel Aviv. The Israeli Prime Minister and his ultra-Orthodox officials plan to give Parliament the power to overturn Supreme Court decisions and appoint judges, a move that critics say will weaken Israel's democracy and foster corruption. This announcement sparked rallies across Tel Aviv, Jerusalem and the northern city of Haifa. Communities are in danger, such as the LGBTQ community and other minorities. Today is them, but tomorrow it can be me. It's very scary and we need to be united. I'm worried about my daughter's future. I want her to be free in her country to do whatever she wants. If she grows up to love women, then be it. If she grows up to love a Palestinian, so be it. I want her to have all the possibilities. Opposition leaders and the Supreme Court president have strongly opposed this plan. Former Defence Minister Benny Gantz even posted a video of himself at the protests on Twitter encouraging people to fight against the reform. Netanyahu, who is on trial for corruption, has placed the Supreme Court reform at the forefront of his agenda. If carried through, he could evade conviction or even remove his trial completely. The United Arab Emirates has decided to invest $30 billion in South Korea's industries as the two countries seek to expand economic cooperation. The end invest decisions was announced as South Korea's President Yoon suk yeol met his UAE counterpart Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan in Abu Dhabi during a four-day state visit. As UAE fighter jets paraded near the palace with red and blue smoke representing South Korean colors, President Yoon Suk-yeon met with his UAE counterpart Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan on the second day of his state visit to the United Arab Emirates, the very first state visit to the West Asian country by a South Korean president. During the hour-long face-to-face, the UAE announced its decision to invest 30 billion U.S. dollars in South Korean industries, the largest investment ever by the UAE in a single nation. That decision, the UAE president said, was based on his confidence in South Korea that keeps promises under all circumstances. During the time our nations have worked together, we've written a success story in setting a global example in the peaceful use of nuclear energy. The investment expected to be directed at nuclear power, defense, hydrogen and solar energy industries, among others, also includes the 13 memorandums of understanding signed at the summit. One is an agreement between the state-run Korea Development Bank and the Abu Dhabi state fund Mubudala to cooperate for investment in South Korean companies. To ensure swift and flawless execution of the agreement, we will provide our full support by creating an investment cooperation platform between South Korea and the UAE. This will enable the two sides to share investment information and enter partnerships more smoothly. Yoon and Sheikh Mohammed agree that their in-person meeting this time will serve as a key starting point for the two countries to elevate their strategic partnership and expand cooperation in new areas such as space development, health, culture and people-to-people -people exchanges. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Stay with us.
Welcome back to World News tonight. I'm moving on to the war in Ukraine. The Western alliances respond to Russia's invasion of Ukraine received a shot in the arm this week as multiple European nations for the first time answered President Volodymyr Zelensky's long-standing call to supply modern battle tanks to Kyiv. As fighting continues in eastern Ukraine, the United Kingdom's government has confirmed that it will be the first NATO country to supply its ally with Western tanks. A squadron of 14 tanks called the Challenger 2 will deploy to the conflict in the coming weeks. But what is the Challenger 2 and what kind of impact can it have on the war? The Challenger 2 is what's called a main battle tank, or MBT, and it's specifically designed to attack other tanks and armored vehicles, seen here during NATO exercises two years ago. Until now, Ukraine's military has primarily relied on its older Soviet-era tanks. It's also captured and repurposed some of Russia's during the invasion. President Zelensky has long pleaded with allied countries to include their tanks in aid packages, but some Western officials have been cautious over the concern that Russia or even China could get their hands on advanced Western military technology. Moscow is also likely to see the introduction of Western tanks onto the battlefield as an escalation of the war, and NATO is desperate not to be drawn more directly into it. The Challenger 2 has been in service with the British Army since 1994 and has been deployed to Bosnia, Iraq, and other crises. The UK's gift could put added pressure on other NATO countries, particularly the US and Germany, to give their own tanks, which have so far resisted. Along with the Challenger 2, Britain's also giving Ukraine about 30 artillery vehicles called the AS-90. It will take time to train the Ukrainian forces on how to use the British tanks and artillery, and Russia's London embassy is dismissing the development. The embassy says the Challengers are unlikely to turn the tide of the war, will drag it out, and will be targeted by Russia's own forces. On the other hand, Russia and Belarus began joint military exercises which have triggered fears in Kyiv and the West that Moscow could use its ally to launch a new ground offensive in Ukraine. Russia used its neighbor Belarus as a springboard for its invasion of Ukraine last February. The Belarusian Defense Ministry said that the two allies will conduct air force drills from January 16th to February 1st using all Belarus military airfields and began joint army exercises involving a mechanized brigade subdivision on Monday. Minsk says the air drills are defensive and it will not enter the war despite the extreme proximity to the war front. According to a post on the Belarusian Defense Ministry's Telegram app, Pavel Muraveko, the first deputy state secretary of Belarusian Security Council, said that Belarus is maintaining restraint and patience, keeping our gunpowder dry. Moscow denies that it has been pressuring Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko to take a more active role in the conflict in Ukraine. Ukraine has continuously warned of possible attacks from Belarus and President Vladimir Zelensky said last week that the country must be ready at its border with Belarus. Belarus has conducted numerous military exercises since the invasion began, both on its own and jointly with Russia. Together with Moscow, Minsk has also been bolstering the drills with weaponry and military equipment. Unofficial telegram military monitoring channels have been reporting a series of fighters, helicopters and military transport planes coming to Belarus since the start of the year. Eight fighters and four cargo planes on Sunday alone. The Belarusian Defense Ministry said that only units of Russia's air forces have been arriving in Belarus. Indonesia has deployed a warship to its north Natna Sea to monitor a Chinese Coast Guard vessel that has been active in a resource-rich maritime area of an area that both countries claim as their own. The Indonesian Ocean Justice Initiative stated that tracking data has shown the vessel CCG-5901 has been sailing in the Natuna Sea, particularly near the Tuna Block gas field and the Vietnamese Shim Sao oil and gas field since December 30th. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or the UNCLOS, gives vessels navigation rights through an exclusive economic zone, or EEZ. The activity comes after an EEZ agreement between Indonesia and Vietnam and approval from Indonesia to develop the tuna gas field in the Natuna Sea, with a total estimated investment of more than $3 billion up to the start of production. In 2021, vessels from Indonesia and China shadowed each other for months near a submersible oil rig that had been performing well appraisals in the tuna block. 
At the time, China urged Indonesia to say the activities were happening in its territory. Indonesia, Southeast Asia's biggest nation, says that under UNCLOS, the southern end of the South China Sea is its exclusive economic zone and named the area as the North Natuna Sea in 2017. China rejects this, saying the maritime area is within its expansive territorial claim in the controversial South China Sea marked by a U-shaped nine-dash line, a boundary the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague found no legal basis in 2016. Climate activist Greta Thunberg and other protesters were physically removed by police in Western Germany from a demonstration protesting a coal mine. In an operation that began on Wednesday, hundreds of officers and riot police cleared around 300 activists from the Western German hamlet of Lutzerath. The village of Lutzerath will soon be a memory. It's being demolished to make way for the expansion of a vast open cast coal mine. The only occupants left are protesters determined to frustrate the diggers, but they're outnumbered by police officers sent from all across Germany. Their job is to get the activists out, to enable Lutzerat's destruction. These people had just been expelled. Destroying Lutzerat means breaking the Paris Agreement. It's, if you look at the, um, the amount of coal that they want to dig up here, it's getting over, this, over the budget. The mine expands relentlessly, a precipice that inches towards you. And watching over it still, protesters on poles and in tree houses. They are human barriers. The huge digging machines loom over this countryside. Thousands came today to join a demonstration against the expansion. Among them, perhaps the world's best known climate <laughs> activist. They should stop what's happening uh, here immediately, stop the destruction and uh, ensure climate justice for everyone. They squelched through mud and rain and confronted the police. There is real anger here and at times it boiled over. Germany has a Green Party in its government, but an energy plan that involves more coal. And for many, that's confusing. Lutherath is now more rubble than anything else, but the protests rumble on. Neither the people nor the village are going quietly. France has opened a hub for testing electric air taxis as it seeks to introduce the world's first service with the new category of aircraft in time for the 2024 Summer Olympics in Paris. Aeroports de Paris, which runs the French capital's major airports, will operate the facility alongside UK-based Sky Sports, a leading developer of so-called Vetiports, as flying taxi bases have been termed. This could be the taxi of the future. Not the distant future, but a very close one indeed. 2024 to be precise, as manufacturers of drone or air taxis look to start rolling out their product to the general public. But with such a huge technological leap happening so soon, the question on many people's minds will be, are they safe? The head of the EU's Aviation Safety Agency says yes. This unmanned air taxi on show at an expo in Brussels aims to be in use by the Paris 2024 Olympics, flying people across the city in just over a year and a half. Known as the Velocity, its fully electric 18 drone rotors produce zero emissions and it's four times less noisy than a conventional helicopter, able to make journeys of around 20 kilometers. This green element fits perfectly into the European Commission's drone strategy as it looks to integrate air taxis into the EU's smart, green and digital cities initiative. The strategy aims to further develop Europe's drone market and large-scale commercial operations for multi-purpose usage. One Europe-wide study shows that acceptance of medical deliveries by drones is well over 50%, but not quite there yet for taxi and personal services. The next question is of affordability. For now, most people would not be able to fork out for a ride in an air taxi, but Brussels and manufacturers hope to change this in the near future. Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Indonesia's Surabaya court will hold its first trial for a deadly soccer stampede in East Java that killed 135 people in October 2022. Five people stand to face the trial for the case including three police officers and two match organizers.
Barcelona crowned Spanish Super Cup champions of the world from Gavi, Robert Lewandowski and Pedri earned for a 3-1 win over bitter rivals Real Madrid. Londoners in the street food haven of Camden welcomed government plans to ban a range of single-use plastic items such as cutlery, plates and bowls in England, which some saying that the measures did not go far enough. Tens of thousands of health workers protested in Madrid over what they claim is the destruction of the public health system by the Conservative regional government. After nearly three years of COVID-19 pandemic disruptions, the 2023 Davos Forum has held fully in person that started today. The forum means a return to the Swiss Alpine town for heads of state leaders of business, finance and culture as well as philanthropists and members of civil society from 130 countries. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we add tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now, the spring festivities are nearing and we are leaving you tonight with Chinese getting ready with their spring festival activities, staging their festive work. Stay safe and have a good night.